The second piece that, that we do is litigation defense. So sometimes, no matter how you know, good a job we do, they get sued anyway. And uh, then we will take over the case and defend the client in court. Um, and we do that uh, throughout the United States, mostly here in Utah, but we've defended those claims uh, for some of our clients that have multiple media properties across the country. And we'll litigate those cases from the trial court all the way through the, the appellate courts. The, the third piece is access. So uh, that relates to your job as a reporter trying to find things out and put them in the paper, find things out and get them on radio or on TV. A lot of times you're, you're trying to cover government and government's not always the most forthcoming about telling you what they're doing and they may deny access to some records that, that you believe are public and or may, maybe you're covering a meeting, a government meeting and they say, oh, we need to close this meeting and they kick the reporter out. We'll get involved at that stage and advise the reporter or the editor about their rights of access under the state sunshine laws to get access to those records, to get access to those meetings or to get access to those court proceedings. And there's a patchwork of, of laws that provide those rights to you and everybody else that wants access to government information. And in Utah, it's the Government Records Access and Management Act called GRAMA. That's a, a statutory right that you have as a citizen to get information. And I was involved in the group of uh, journalists and, and legislators that drafted that law back in 1991. So it's been on the books for quite a while and it provides some really good protections for uh, people to get information from from government in terms of uh, records. Then we have what uh, is called the Open and Public Meetings Act. That's a right that guarantees a statute that guarantees your right to get access to government meetings like school boards, uh, city councils, county councils, the legislature. And we will get involved uh, representing news organizations who are kicked out of those meetings to try to get them back in or to challenge those closures in court. And those are really important um, statutes because if you think about them, they're really sort of foundational type statutes uh, with respect to self-government. They're like our, our constitution because they, they define the rights between the, those who are governing and those who are being governed. Okay, So we, we own the government, um, but unless we have a right to get information about what they're doing and have input, it's really kind of a hollow right. So. I, I think that, that these are really, you know, uh, meaningful and important statutes that I think the public, they, they intuitively care about them. And I think this was shown a few years ago, I don't know if you, any of you remember, when the legislature tried to pass a, a, a law called HB 477 that would have gutted the state's open records law, and they did it in a really stealthy, kind of sneaky fashion shoved it through in like three days, and there was this huge public out, outrage in Utah over the, the fact that they would try to do this. And that forced the governor to call a special session and they repealed the law. And that was due to the public saying, no, this is important to us and we don't want you messing with it. So that's the third piece is, is access. And related to, to access is a um, service that our firm uh, has been operating for almost uh, 25 years now. I started it when I, when I came to the firm and it's the Utah Freedom of Information Hotline. And, the, and we've received calls from reporters from the signpost uh, and from your, your faculty through the years. And, and my idea was that we'd have this free legal resource that would be available to students and to journalists and to members of the public that if you're kicked out of a meeting, or you denied access to a record, you could call and get a lawyer on the line for free who would advise you about your rights of access to government information. And we've been running that, um, like I said, for almost 25 years. We, we average about three calls a week, and we've trained a team of lawyers at the firm that take those calls uh, at all hours, uh, because sometimes reporters are covering things, you know, and uh, during times that aren't business hours. 
And we've had a lot of success in getting people access to information, um, including signpost uh, reporters, access to your government uh, student body uh, proceedings. So that is sort of connected to the access. So we'll basically do everything for free, give you advice, uh, send letters, uh, negotiate up to the point where you have to file a lawsuit and then we can't do that for free but really up to that point um, everything else is is for free and we view that as a pro bono commitment of our of our firm uh, the last piece is uh, subpoenas and I don't know if you've covered this in your law class but the nature of, of what reporters do puts them makes them attractive targets for subpoenas. And so what I mean by that is reporters are always out there covering controversial issues and they're covering disputes. Whether it's a lawsuit, whether it's a criminal proceeding, they're getting information. They may have a jailhouse interview with the guy that's been charged with murder. And this, is a, this is a real case that we handle for the, uh, the paper down in St. George. And the prosecutor finds out about that and wants to know what the, the defendant told the reporter. And it's in the reporter's notes and some of it that the, the reporter published in the paper, but some of it she didn't publish. Or maybe it's a confidential source and the prosecutor wants to find out what the con who the confidential source is. And until recently, Utah had no protection for journalists and its, its laws to protect the journalists from protecting their confidential source. And you can imagine uh, the difficulty that that places reporters in because unless you're able, I mean, when you make a promise of confidentiality that I will not identify you in the story, um, that's only as, that promise is only as good as the law enforces it, right? So you can promise all you want, but if you get a subpoena, and the judge says, hey, there's no law that says that you have this protection, then you have a choice between going to jail for being held in contempt of court or providing the information. So it was a really tough situation for news organizations and reporters to be in. So we were like one of only three states that did not have what they call a reporter shield law. And so we went to the Utah Supreme Court and I went there on behalf of the, the Utah news media and we started this process of talking about enacting a reporter shield law. And we studied it and we went back and forth for about a year and then finally the Utah Supreme Court enacted a reporter's uh, shield rule in Utah and it provides protection for reporters to protect the, the identity of confidential sources. Um, it provides protection for unpublished news information. So you're out there, you're gathering all kinds of information, but only you know, a portion of it gets in the paper. And there is a First Amendment interest in protecting your editorial discretion and not publishing the stuff that you decide not to publish and being forced to divulge that to lawyers and, and judges and prosecutors. So it also provides protection for that, unpublished news gathering information. It's not absolute protection. I mean, if the prosecutor or whoever is trying to get the information can show that they can't get it anywhere else, they can't get it from a non-journalistic source, and that it's critical to the, the prosecution of the case, then they can overcome the, the privilege. But it is a pretty robust uh, protection. Uh, it's probably in the top, I'd say, quarter uh, among all states in terms of uh, the, the strength of the protections that it gives Utah reporters. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's provided some clarity to the law because before we were arguing about whether there was protection or not, and as a lawyer, I was arguing on cases decided by the United States Supreme Court and other other courts saying, hey, you ought to recognize this privilege, and some judges would recognize it, some wouldn't, but now everybody knows what the rule is, and so uh, we can all proceed from the, the same legal framework. So that's the last uh, sort of piece of the, the practice is the, the subpoena piece. And oftentimes we can negotiate um, with the prosecutor, whoever it is trying to get the information. So 
Because reporters are such an easy target, oftentimes the prosecutors or defense attorneys or the lawyers just send a subpoena to them without trying to see whether they can get the information anywhere else. And so what I'll often do in these cases is negotiate with the prosecutor and say, hey, you know, you can actually get this information from this person or have you tried getting the information from the person that, that my reporter talked to instead of getting it from, from my reporter and we can, we can get the subpoenas withdrawn often by uh, a negotiated process with whoever it is that's serving the, the subpoena. And if you have questions any, on any of this, ask them as we're going along. I think our group is small enough that we can do that. Um, so that's the, that's the fourth sort of area that, that we practice in. And now I'd like to sort of go through some of the materials um, in, uh, that I've handed out to you to illustrate some of these, these, uh, these concepts that I've been talking about. Any questions so far? Anything that I've prepared? Okay. So for the last three years, I've been coming up here twice a year talking about one case. Um, and it's the Dan Schroeder case. And last time I was here, we had had the Utah Supreme Court argument, uh, but the, the court had not released its opinion. And it just it released its opinion, and Dan Schroeder won his case. So let me talk to you a little bit about the Dan Schroeder case, because this is homegrown Weber State uh, making law. Dan, Dan Schroeder is a physics professor at Weber State. And he's also kind of one of these uh, citizen activist, blogger. He's a guy that, that really cares about what local government is doing. And he follows uh, the budget at Ogden and, and the mayor's race and the city council <laughs> race. So he's an involved uh, citizen activist. And he uh, noticed that this organization called Envision Ogden was, had filed these campaign finance reports showing that they had made political donations and he thought well that's really strange because I thought Envision Ogden was created by Mayor Godfrey to promote economic development in Ogden and indeed that's the way it was pitched they created this organization called Envision Ogden and the idea was go to Zions Bank and McKay Hospital and the governor's office of economic development ask them for money and they did. They asked him for money and said, give us money. We're going to promote outdoor tourism in the Ogden area. And it sounded like a good idea. So these organizations all gave money. And they gave almost $90,000 in donations to this group. And then, unbeknownst to all those donors, uh, the, the organizers of Envision Ogden, including Mayor Godfrey, took that money and they funneled it through this intermediary shell organization and gave it to political campaigns, including they spent it on Merrick Godfrey's campaign, they spent it on the campaigns of people who were political allies of Merrick Godfrey trying to get elected on the Ogden City Council, they spent some of it on a, on a Republican state legislative campaign, and you know, that uh, is not what the people who were giving the money thought it was going to be spent on. And so there are, there are regulations if you are a political action committee and you're raising money for campaigns and you have to file reports. And this organization hadn't done any of that. And so Dan found out that this was going on. He told the media and the media started covering it. And then as a result of the media coverage, the state attorney general's office started investigating it and they found out that all this had happened that uh, this organization had violated local state and national campaign finance laws uh, they they interviewed these donors and they said hey we had no idea you know our money was going to fund political campaigns and in fact we have internal policies that prohibit us from giving to political campaigns so they were upset and so, you know, the, the anticipation was that there would be some uh, prosecutions. Well, time goes on and nothing happens. And this, by the way, was during the Shirtliff and Swallow administrations. Uh, our two former uh, attorney generals who are now facing criminal prosecution for um, other, other problems. And um, Dan, he, he, when they closed the investigation, 
That wasn't enough for Dan. Dan says, well, I want to see the investigative records to find out how this money flowed and who was writing the checks and, and uh, why you didn't prosecute him. So he, he asked for the records and he gets some investigative records like the investigative summary report, but they don't give him the bank records, the checks, so he could actually follow the money trail. They don't give him this quickened summary that was prepared that kind of uh, summarized the money trail. And they didn't give him a post-it note written by one of the investigators. And we were helping Dan through this hotline that I've told you about. He called us up and me and my partner David Ryman were talking to him and kind of coaching him through this process. And finally it got to the point where we had exhausted all of his remedies. He'd gone to the State Records Committee and he'd lost. Um, the AG's office said, no, you can't have it. And so his last remedy was to go to court in the third district court in Salt Lake. And so that's what he did. He, he represented himself, pro se, he filed this lawsuit saying, hey, these records are public. This is a really important deal about political corruption in Ogden. You should give me these records. And we sort of helped him through that process behind the scenes and the judge got led down this really wrong path by the lawyer for the AG's office and the judge ruled against Dan on everything. He, right down the line, he denied him access to everything. And the rationale was really, really bad. And what the judge said was, I think that if I gave you these bank records, it would violate the state constitutional provision against unreasonable search and seizure because the people, uh, the, the, the uh, organization that had this uh, account never expected you to get these records. And that's wrong on so many levels, but the most basic level is if you have a lawful subpoena and records are produced in response to a lawful subpoena, there is no Fourth Amendment violation. That's it. So there was no you know, unlawful search and seizure. Um, and the state constitution doesn't trump the, the rights of access that we have under grandma. And besides, this was a defunct political organization that was engaged in illegal conduct. So, you know, you really shouldn't shield their records to begin with under the Fourth Amendment, even assuming that that analysis was right. So, after that decision, we looked at the case and we thought, you know, this is really bad law and we ought to really fix this uh, because this could hurt future people trying to get access to government records. So we took the case on pro bono to the Utah Supreme Court. And my partner, David Ryman, argued it before the Utah Supreme Court over a year ago. And just within the last uh, uh, few months, uh, we got a d the decision from the Utah Supreme Court. And they reversed the trial judge on everything. They said the trial judge was wrong on every single thing that he had ruled on. He was wrong about the Fourth Amendment uh, protection. He was wrong about the quick and summary, and he was wrong about the post-it note and the investigator, and he ordered all of it to be released to Dan. So Dan was vindicated after three years of, of all this struggle to get this information. So he got, you know, and at this point, it was more about the precedent and the principle than sort of the value of what he would get. Although he did find some interesting things, and you could see, read his blog if you Google him, and you could read his blog about the money trail that he was able to piece together and who was actually writing the checks and what this uh, shell organization, what its role was. So if you're into Ogden politics and stuff, it's probably interesting to you, but most people probably moved beyond since it's kind of old. But the principle that he set in the case is very important. And the Supreme Court said um, a few things. One is that this case that the judge had relied on to say it was an unreasonable search and seizure. It had no application in the grandma context where these records were obtained pursuant to a lawful subpoena. They were part of the investigative file and there was no exception in grandma for them. And the public interest was very compelling in releasing the information. And what was the interest on the other side in keeping it secret? There wasn't any. This organization was defunct. The people that uh, had run it had violated you know, campaign finance laws and there was public interest in finding out what the money trail was. So that's number one. The second really important principle was that the, AG's argue, the AG argued at the Supreme Court that, 
that you, the court should just consider generalized interests in uh, privacy or generalized interest in investigative, uh, protecting investigations. And the Supreme Court said no. Uh, what, what you really need to look at is whether release of this specific record would interfere with an ongoing investigation. And in this case, the investigation had been closed for years, so it wasn't going to interfere with any investigation. Or would release of these records invade someone's privacy, a particular person's privacy? And the court said no, because the people that had made these donations had already been publicly identified when they tried to cover their tracks and they filed their political campaign disclosure reports. They had to name them all. Anybody that donated over $1,000 had to be named. So there was no privacy interest. So it was a very important legal decision in terms of sort of defining what the burden is on government to hold things back. Um, so it created some good law. David did a, a great job arguing it at the Supreme Court. And Dan did a, a great job, you know, just sort of sticking with, with the, the battle for so long. So um, just share that with you, Weber State, you know, professor making some, some good law here uh, on open records in Utah. And that's, that's uh, tabs. Uh, one, which is the story that was done by the Ogden Standard Examiner on the Supreme Court win, and then it got picked up nationally by this Media Law Resource Center, which is out of New York, and we wrote a little story for them um, that was published at, at tab two. Any questions about that? Okay. Okay, police body cam. And the, this is a subject that's gotten a lot of national attention in light of the, the police shootings that have, have attracted a lot of attention in the last year or so in the United States. And, and a lot of law enforcement um, agencies are equipping their officers with, with body cams. And they're doing it for a lot of different reasons, but one of the reasons is the idea that if officers are equipped with body cams and they're involved in an incident that you'll have a record of what actually happened instead of this sort of conflicting versions about what happened and that promotes transparency with respect to law enforcement and it promotes accountability um, both for the, the officers and people who are interacting uh, with the officers um, and so the question arises, there's a whole bunch of questions about body cams. When should, you know, they turn them on and all that. But my clients are more interested in the record that is created by the body cam, by, by, by the body camera itself. So when that video is taken by a law enforcement officer, you're creating a record, okay? Because video is a record under our state open records statute, just like audio recordings are, paper records, email, text messages. If they're created by government or the uh, government is possessing them, they're a record. And then you have to decide, well, what protection should we have for non-disclosure? And when should that be made available to the public, right? And states and federal government are, are grappling with this issue. And, it's all over the map right now across the across the country some um, law enforcement jurisdictions like uh, the los angeles sheriff's department are saying we're it's part, it's evidence in a case and we're just not going to release it so there's an officer involved shooting or there's an altercation or a, an allegation of unreasonable use of force they're not releasing the video unless they they have to uh, by a court order other jurisdictions are saying it's presumptively public, but there are certain exceptions to the release. And so last session, the Utah legislature got involved in this and they did not pass a bill about body cams, but they're expected to deal with it again this session, starting in January. And so we are starting to meet uh, me on behalf of the Utah news media uh, with Senate and, and House sponsors of legislation to talk about the access piece of the, the equation. And you can you can understand the, the 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 competing interests here, right? Because 
It's different than dash cam video. Dash cam video is usually almost always going to be taken in a public place, right? Because that officer comes up and he's pulling over someone and you're on, in a public area. You're usually in a highway or a street or a public setting. So there aren't as many privacy concerns about dash cam video. You know, there may be some if there's a minor that is captured on the, the dash cam video or, you know, uh, certain, certain situations you can imagine there's some privacy interest, but usually not too many. Body cam video is different because body cam can, the body cam goes wherever the officer goes and officers go into places where people have an expectation of privacy. They go into homes, they go into bedrooms and they film everything that is in there when the body cam is active. So if there are kids in there, they're going to get picked up. There may be a sexual assault victim who gets filmed. Uh, there may, you know, be all kinds of intimate things that are in your house that you don't expect to show up on Facebook or the internet, right? And so that is the concern is, is you know, these competing interests of privacy interests and then law enforcement interests um, and the public interests because on the other side of the equation if the officer is involved in an office in a force uh, use of force incident where the officer has, has drawn his or her weapon and there is an in, there is an injury or a, a death that that uh, occurs then obviously the public has an interest in, in that uh, incident and that body cam is going to sh you know show that that uh, what happened in that in that particular incident and I think this is really it cuts both ways because I think sometimes this video you know we see the video that maybe the video that gets a lot of the attention is where it, it's determined that the officer acted inappropriately. The suspect is running and the officer is shooting at him or whatever. But it, it also cuts the other way. And I think an example of this was this video that, that was captured about a year ago. I live in the avenues and there was this, there was this uh, situation in the lower avenues where there was a report about a suspicious character in the neighborhood and the police arrived and this this fellow uh, was was uh, had a snow shovel and uh, and the police officer interacted with them and then the guy attacked the officer with the snow shovel and the officer uh, pulled his handgun and shot the the person dead and if you see the if you saw the initial reports about it uh, without the body cam you think well that doesn't seem right you know snow shovel and and the, the guy, the officer shoots him, that seemed a little disproportionate. But when you saw the video, I mean, the way this guy was coming at the officer with the, uh, with the snow shovel, you could see how the officer would fear for his life or safety. And it, it made it an entirely different uh, assessment, at least in my mind, about the reasonableness of the, the officer's action. And I think a lot of other people had the same reaction. So it can also, you know, uh, exonerate or support the officer's version uh, of the event. So this is an issue that's that's going to be uh, dealt with this session, uh, likely. And uh, the the uh, position that the news media <coughs> is taken is that this video, first of all, should be treated like a record under grandma. It should come under the rubric of the grandma statute. And we should use grandma's existing exceptions to protect the privacy interests or the law enforcement interests against non-disclosure. So under, under our statute, all records are presumed to be public unless there is an exception that says that they're non-public. So that's the basic principle of the statute, this presumption of access subject to exceptions. And we have a lot of exceptions and they've added to them through the years. But you know, one of them is whether release of the record would interfere with an ongoing investigation. So an officer captures footage um, in, in, the, in, a, in a situation and law enforcement believes that if they released it at that time, suspects might get away 
or you know they would, wouldn't be able to find a witness or whatever, then they could withhold it under that exception. Or um, they believe maybe it's a gang-related incident and there's a witness and they capture the identity of the witness and they believe that if they released that, that image of the witness, that person's life could be in danger. And so they pix you can pixelate that person's identity and not release the identity. And there's a lot of technology out there that makes this kind of editing um, very easy now to pixelate um, this, this video. Um, you could have a situation where, like I said, you, you fil you're filming minors. Um, or, you know, the officers just go to the, to, the, to the house, there's a report of domestic violence, and it turns out that there's nothing to it. They don't make any arrests. Um, no one is cited or anything, but they capture all this intimate, you know, this footage inside the, the house and the bedroom, and some nosy neighbor he just wants to get the footage, you know? So he submits a grammar request. Well, you know, that doesn't seem right. So you gotta have protection for that. And there's a privacy exception in grammar that says that if release of the record would interfere, uh, would, would constitute an invasion of privacy, then it's protected. You, can't, you don't get that. So you need to have that protection. And our, our view, at least the view of the news media, is that we ought to have this presumption of access subject to all these exceptions. And, and these exceptions provide law enforcement with the ability to withhold it, but it also provides the ability of the public to get the stuff, you know, when there's a use of force incident, when they're serving search warrants, when the public interest is compelling, they would be able to get the, the uh, video. And sometimes, you know, it may be just a matter of redacting or pixelating identities, you know, it's where you get you can see what happened, but if there's minors involved or a witness or whatever, you just obscure their identity so you can't you can't see who they are. Any comments, questions about that? Well, just when you mentioned the editing, I was thinking like, are there going to be any guidelines for editing? Like, if you give up that, like the video of the officer, or they get the video, and then the person that gets it edits it and makes it just completely different yeah. in reality. Like, is there any sort of regulations with that or there, there's really there's that? really not I mean once the government because that could happen with any record right mm -hmm. yeah, it could happen with any audio recording you get or any video or any paper record you could alter it and so I think what what we rely on is other the the marketplace of ideas to point that out to point out that it's been altered and to rat that person out but there isn't really any ability of government to control the record or your use of the record once they release it. Yeah, that's a good point. What are, you, what are your th thoughts about that, that, that balance between um, body cams? And you guys thought about body cams in general, whether they're a good idea or a bad idea, um, what should happen to the video that's created? Well, sorry. Um, so, from what you were saying, it seems like anytime an officer does anything, the body cam's on. And so, anytime an officer, like, all of that is public record, even if it's not meaningful. So, like, like you said, like the nosy neighbor and like, that sort of thing, like, that's kind of iffy. Yeah, well, that, that is what they're trying to decide is, so there's the access piece, you know, if there is a record created, how do you deal with the access to it, right? So that's one issue. The other issue is, when, who gets them? When should they be turned on? When are they turned off? That, that's an entirely separate issue, and that is what they're trying to figure out, is they're not necessarily going to be on all the time because they don't have the, the battery capacity uh, for that. So they can only be typically turned on for times when they feel like it's appropriate to put them on. But then again, you don't want to give the officers too much discretion to turn it on and off because they may, you know, choose to turn it off when it should be on. So those are the things that they're grappling with is when, do, when should they be turned on? Do you make rules about that? Uh, it's really difficult when you think about it because there's so many different situations. It's probably going to depend on every situation whether it goes on or not. <clears throat> Other comments or questions about that? Yeah. Are all states, like how many states are requiring officers, or is it just specifically in like 
urban areas or you know? It's a very good question. In Utah, no state, uh, the state does not mandate use of body cam. So right now, it's totally up to the local law enforcement jurisdictions about whether they want them or not. And some states are mandating that their local law enforcement um, agencies have body cams. And then they have various different kinds of rules about when they need to turn them on and off and all that. But that is what they're trying to grapple with, is whether this should be a state mandate. Should you have uniform rules about all this stuff? I mean, are, is, the, is the situation in Ogden or Salt Lake going to be the same as in Loa or Moab or Syracuse? You know, depending, does the size of the jurisdiction make any difference in the resources that they have? These are tough issues, and this is what they're going to have to grapple with. Aside from the access piece, just who's going to fund it? How are they going to pay for it? Should you have a state mandate, or should we leave it up to the local jurisdictions? It's a good question. I was thinking of the body cam like a city meeting. If the city meeting chose to have minutes or not have minutes, like to do notes or not have notes, it would be the same thing with officers going into similar situations. Oh, I'm going to keep the camera off here. Oh, I'm going to turn it on here. It's kind of the same thing. Kind of public access with all the exceptions for the news media to be able to get it. But in an event that, oh, the officer just forgot to turn it on. Yeah. You know, when they knew they were going to be in some type of situation, it's somebody who they've dealt with before or something like that, they forget to turn it on. And that would be like a city meeting doing minutes. And then the next time they have a meeting, they don't do any minutes. And Yes, yeah. there's no consistency. No, it's a really good point. That's exactly the issue they're they're grappling with is, you know, s selective use by the officer of yeah. turning it on or off, and whether, you know, you need to have some guidelines that kind of police and limit that discretion. Um, at the same time, you know, the privacy advocates say, are we in an Orwellian society now, where everything is recorded? I mean, if you go downtown Salt Lake, there's cameras everywhere. And are we going to have police now just creating reams of video so we don't have any any privacy? Um, that's sort of the other side of it. Well, is my other question would be like, how long would they like hold that footage? Yep. For? Retention. Because I mean, like, you know, somewhere down the line they want to they, they they knew there was an officer involved. Like, if someone's trying to convict them, they knew they had a prior record. They could, I suppose, search for that cam. They had a cam on at the time when they. Address like for politicians or for any other public figure who perhaps was involved with something. Um, so I think that would be interesting. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Uh, what should the retention period be once they create it? Um, you know, is it going to be like 48 hours and they get rid of it, or if it's if it falls into certain category, officer use of force, searching search warrant, a complaint has been filed about excessive force, then you keep it for it an unlimited amount of time until it's been adjudicated. These are all things that they need to sort out too. And storage, I mean, initially they were kind of saying cost is a factor. With, with the computers now, it, cost really isn't a factor on storage of the, the video. What if um, the footage is just extremely graphic? Like something just very graphic and very yeah. disturbing, like a zag. Are there going to be regulations there? In regards to it being released to the public just because yeah, and you can you can see the the competing interests there. So we have this this unwarranted invasion of privacy exception, which maybe they they cite that they say, hey, this is really gruesome. But at the same time, it's an officer involved shooting, and it's, it happens to be gruesome. Um, the the way the particular shooting went down, does the public have an interest in actually seeing that? Um, so those are. You know, do you just rely on the editorial discretion of the media not to publish the gruesome details, but to get the, the information out to the public? That's the balance that they're trying to strike. It's a tough, tough lines to draw. Other questions, comments? Yeah. Um, worry I would have is like a situation goes down in the late term and the officer doesn't want that footage to be seen, so he removes the, the memory chip and just destroys it. You know, obviously that would put him in a bad situation anyway, but um, they would definitely be, I think it would empower the officers a lot more than we assume it would um, in that case. That's the way I would have 
Yeah, it's so that could happen. Um, and it's similar to the other scenario about turning it on or off. I think if they destroyed the memory chip, though, you probably got maybe a little more uh, exposure as an officer to try to find that out, you know, what happened to the memory chip. Whereas if you just didn't turn it off, you turn it on, you could say, oh, I just forgot to turn it on. Um, but, you know, you contrast that with the situation now where it's a lot of law enforcement just not wearing body cams. So maybe it's better than nothing um, because if you at least have some of them wearing and you've got some guidelines, there are always going to be people. You can't, you can't uh, account for all the bad apples. I mean, there's going to be bad actors everywhere who are going to violate the rules, but most people are going to follow the guidelines and the rules. And if you have that, then maybe it's better than not having any, you know, any video from the body cams. Um, to the next two topics. So watch that at the legislature. That should be they should be debating that this next session. Is that only for Utah? Pardon? Is that only for the Utah legislature? Yeah. <laughs> yep, Utah. So the fourth is just a Supreme Court case that I wanted to, to highlight for you. It came out last term. It's called Reed versus Town of Gilbert. And it really I think is kind of was kind of a sleeper case. It wasn't a case that got a lot of press, but it has some First Amendment consequences. So there was this town, Gilbert, Arizona, that had a sign ordinance. And it uh, said that if you wanted to have a sign, you had to get a permit. But it had a list of ex exceptions, and like 23 exceptions from the ordinance. And among those were like political campaign signs. So if you had a political campaign sign, you didn't have to get a permit. But if you were this church, and they had this, this church here involved in, in Gilbert that was kind of an itinerant church. They met at different locations every other week. And so they had to have signs. They put directional signs up to tell people where the meeting was that particular week. And they had to get a permit for that because it was a directional sign. And they thought, well, that seems weird that we have to get a permit to tell our you know, our, our worshipers where to go, but political campaign signs are everywhere and they don't have to get a permit. And so they challenged it. Um, and the, it was upheld by the lower courts and it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that the ordinance was invalid. It violated the First Amendment because it discriminated against speech based on the content of the speech, right? So if you had political speech, you didn't need to get a permit. If you had these directional signs, like in this case for the church, um, you had to get a permit. And they said that's a content-based uh, discrimination. And that's not allowed under the First Amendment unless you can clear this really high bar that says that the regulation is narrowly tailored to serve a compelling governmental interest. And there are no less restrictive alternatives to serve that interest. And the court found that there were all kinds of other ways that um, Gilbert could could vindicate whatever interests it was trying to serve by uh, by requiring a permit. So the the interesting part of it was that the way the court defined content-based speech. So before this decision, it was kind of thought that when the court talked about content-based regulations, it was saying that government can't pick and choose and discriminate based on the viewpoint expressed by the speaker. So it can't favor pro, you know, it can't have a, a regulation saying uh, pro-choice speech is okay, but pro-life speech isn't because that's discriminating on the basis of the viewpoint, okay? That's kind of what the thought was, that was the viewpoint not the subject matter. But in, in, in Reed versus Gilbert, the court said, no, that's really not the case. Um, content just means, content-based discrimination just means that you are discriminating based on the subject matter of the speech, whether it's political, whether it's directional. Um, and if you think about that, there's all kinds of content-based regulations that we have. We have content-based regulations on deceptive advertising. 
We have content-based regulations on securities, uh, like people are trying to sell you securities. You can't make false and misleading statements if you're peddling securities to someone. We ha have lots of regulations in the health field. There are all kinds of subject matters or content areas that government discriminates on all the time. They, they choose to regulate one versus not regulate another. And so this has kind of opened the door to all these, these uh, areas of, of speech now that are going to be under attack because of this decision in the securities realm, uh, in the FCC area, um, in the commercial advertising area where those regulations are now going to get attacked. Uh, they're going to say, government, you can't do that unless you meet this really high bar, this, con this strict scrutiny standard that the court set out in uh, the Reed case. So a lot of the First Amendment commentators are, are thinking that the court didn't really think through the consequences of this decision and they're going to look to try to narrow it. But this has been a court that's been very um, free speech protective. Uh, they they uh, have a sort of a libertarian notion about free speech. It was written by Justice Thomas, who is a very, you know, uh, a justice on the court that's very libertarian in his attitude about government hands off uh, uh, speech and and regulation. So, and it was a unanimous decision. You had three of the more liberal justices saying that uh, maybe it should be a little less in strict scrutiny. So, this is one I think that is going to play out in the courts for the next uh, couple years. Any questions about that? Okay, I'm just going to end on open meetings, and I don't know if you've covered this yet in your law class, but I touched on it earlier. Every state has an Open Meetings Act that guarantees uh, the right of access to government meetings. And the question arises, well, is our legislature bound by the Open Meetings Act? Okay? And the, and the short answer is yes, it is. It says it right in the act that it, it it applies to the legislature. So if you have a majority of either house, like the Senate or the House of Representatives, you have a, a quorum, which is a majority, a simple majority, and they're meeting to discuss things that may come up in, in the legislature, then that's an open meeting okay, under the act. And, and they can only close it if, it, if they meet these certain requirements. It has to be about litigation, or they're trying to sell property, um, or they're talking about the deployment of security devices. There are these exceptions in the act, but they have to go through these procedures. They have to vote to close it. They have to say, hey, this is the exception we're relying on. So that, that's the way it works. And the problem is that the legisl legislature hasn't been following the Open Meetings Act when it comes to their own meetings. And the way they get around it is that there is this exception in the act for political caucuses, okay? And a political caucus is like a, a political party, a Republican party or the Democrats, and they want to caucus and talk about party strategy or, or they elect their leader or whatever. <coughs> and so the problem with that is that because the Republicans so dominate the legislature, they have super majorities in each body, whenever there is a, quote, House Republican caucus or a Senate Republican caucus, that's a majority of the, of the body. And so what they do is they say, well, we're going to have a caucus. We're not, we're not meeting as the House. We're meeting as the Republican uh, caucus. And that's what they did on the Medicare expansion. Uh, they, they didn't want to have this debate in public. And so they just said, well, we're, we're going to have a caucus. And so they debated the, the proposal. The, so if you remember Med Medicare, Medicaid expansion, there was uh, these federal dollars that were available. And the legislature said, no, we don't want that. And then Governor Herbert said, well, I've got Healthy Utah, sort of this compromise proposal. And then the, the Republican legislature said, no, we don't want that. So they had this more scaled down proposal and they debated that in this House caucus and they took a vote on it in the House caucus and the public was shut out, the media was shut out 
and then there were conflicting reports, but it died essentially in the caucus. And so the question is, if, if, if you say that you can close meetings like that under the caucus exception, that essentially just swallows the entire Open Meetings Act, right? Because you could say any meeting of a majority of uh, the House or Senate is a caucus. Um, and you can conduct the public's business outside of the view of the public, and that violates the spirit, if not, I think, the letter of the Open Meetings Act. I don't think the caucus exception is that uh, broad. So this, you know, remains to be seen what's going to be done about this. There, there was a lot of coverage about the caucus exception. This is a, a story that Channel 13 did on uh, the secret meeting. There's going to be other... Uh, meetings, you know, and so I, I think that it's probably right for a challenge by someone, whether it's the news media or the ACLU or um, some citizen, maybe another Dan Schroeder will come out of the woodwork and, 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 and challenge this, uh, these types of, of meetings, but um, something needs to be done because it definitely is not the way that it was designed to work. Any questions about the, the Open Meetings Act generally? Um, or these caucus, these closed caucus meetings. Okay. Does it happen often, I guess? In it happens very often. So it used to be that they would rarely close these caucuses. They would keep them open for almost always, and maybe they would close two or three a year. Now they're closing in the House probably 90% of the meetings, and there's dozens of closed caucuses during the session. So essentially, they're using a word to exempt them. So it's like this word is holding so much power. Political caucus. Yeah. yeah. So what can be done? Well, that's the issue is does that word mean that if it's a majority of the body, you can still rely on that exception? I don't think it does because there's, other, there's another part of the statute that says if a simple majority of the body is meeting, and they're discussing the public's business, then that's a meeting under the Open Meetings Act. So I think you could have a sub-quorum group, you could have less than a majority meeting and doing these closed meetings, but not a majority. So it needs to be, the judges decide what the law means, that's what the courts are all about, so until the courts rule on it, they're just gonna keep meeting, you know, have the ability to meet in secret unless the public has an outrage and, and tells them to, you know, and creates enough political pressure for them to not do that anymore. So, in a in a in a caucus, in a closed caucus, um, they were meeting as a party, making decisions about the public, and there were actually representatives of other parties that wouldn't be invited. Correct. Correct. The Democrats weren't invited. Or whoever. Yeah. I mean, and I'm saying in a state where it's the majority of Democrat. Yeah. I mean, either either That's way, true. you've That's got true. leaders that aren't. Okay. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But the problem is, you got a majority of the body that's deciding public policy outside of the public view. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so what happens is they cook it. They cook it in the closed caucus. They get it all figured out what they're going to do, and then they just go out on the floor, and it's all pro forma. I mean, everybody, the whole thing is scripted. They all know their parts. They all know what position they're going to take. They've already taken a vote. But they can vote again, but they're still the majority. Yeah, the majority, so, yeah. The Democrats don't have enough votes. And if it was the Democrats, you know, it would be the same concern. It's not a partisan issue. It's a process issue. So, and, so is this happening in Utah or only Utah? Or is it happening in, or in like, majority of states that have a majority party? I, I have not party. seen the caucus exception used like this um, in other states, at least in the legislature. Caucuses like Iowa has a caucus system. Right. And, you know, they can caucus and it's not open to the, it's not a public meeting under the Open Meetings Act there, but this is different. This is like the legislature yeah. caucusing. Yeah. Well, it's almost like, what are you trying to hide? Like, like why, why, are, why, why, are, you why, why is it secret? Yeah. yeah, things in the secret are really on. Well, that's, that's, that's the reaction of most people. And these are elected officials. I mean, they're elected to take public positions and take public votes. We didn't elect them to do the public's business behind closed doors. Yeah. So that's the problem. It's, it's like really kind of undermines. What do we do? Like, <laughs> well, you can write letters. You can put pressure on them. I mean, but would that change anything? Because uh, they it, have a hot it's, we don't, Well, it, it does. It, when you look what happened with the Open Meetings or uh, 
grandma with HB 477. There were letters written. There were protests at the Capitol. If that hadn't happened, there was no way that they would have backed down because the governor and the leaders thought it was just the media versus them and it would be a three-day fight and would be over, would blow over. That's not what happened when the public got involved. Social media, that's very powerful. It's all kinds of things you can do. Don't underestimate your power. Any other hmm. questions or comments? Talk about your cameras in the courtroom. Oh, topics yeah. and stuff are something that will come up next week. So Utah um, is kind of was one of the last remaining states that that you couldn't have a media camera in the trial court. So Utah always allowed media uh, video in the appellate court, like the Utah Supreme Court. But that's pretty boring. That's just lawyers you know, making an argument to these judges. It's not witnesses. It's not cross-examination. And so you didn't really see where most of the work got done in the courts, which is the trial courts. And so we um, went to the, the, the Utah Supreme Court and said, you ought to really study this issue and see if it's time. And so they studied it for a year. And I was on that committee. And then they looked at all the studies that had been done, and they found out that the studies were almost uniform in showing that the presence of a camera by itself didn't alter the integrity of the proceedings, it didn't prejudice the proceedings, and that if you had sensible protections like not filming jurors, not filming minors, not filming confidential informants, that you could protect all the interests that needed to be protected. And so. They took that and they created a subcommittee of which I was the chair to draft a rule that would allow media cameras in the trial courts and that rule got enacted about a year ago. And the first big case was this doctor uh, down in Utah County, the plastic surgeon who was accused of killing his wife in the bathtub, drugging her and uh, drowning her in the bathtub. It got national press because of a sensational, Nancy Grace flew out from CNN uh, to cover the trial live and I represented CNN to request permission to have uh, the cameras in the courtroom. The prosecution objected to it because there were these three inmate witnesses that were going to testify against the doctor who said that he confessed to it while he was in prison with them and the prosecutor said if their identities are shown, their faces are shown, they'll be identified as snitches in prison and their lives will be in jeopardy and so we said well if that's the case then just you know don't show their faces have audio but just conceal their identities and the judge said yeah that's what we're going to do so it was a it was a live trial it went on for two weeks and it worked really well the the, the public got to see the inside of a, a trial courtroom for the first time with live video um, you got to see the witnesses testify you got to see it you know live as it happened and it, it really was it was it was informative to the public because you're you're not you're seeing things um, in an unfiltered way you know it's before you had to just read about it now you can actually see what what is happening in the courtroom and how the judge rules on on motions so now in Utah the presumption is that the cameras are allowed in the trial court unless the judge makes findings that it would it would be prejudicial to the right of the defendant to get a fair trial or invade privacy interests and that these less restrictive alternatives of like not filming a particular witness wouldn't work to protect those interests so I think it's been a good development and if you look on the news now you may have seen more coverage I mean it used to be that you could always have a still camera in the, the our, our rule allowed a still camera so if you read this the the standard examiner or the tribune you may have seen a still photo that was taken in the trial court but no video cameras were allowed now the difference is you can see it on the t on the television news what happens in court questions about that okay any other questions well, thank you